Well, brothers and sisters, as I mentioned, uh, as you know, this is Pentecost. And normally, often, when we are looking at the story of Pentecost, we are often looking at the story from the beginning of Acts, where the Holy Spirit is sent to the disciples, and, uh, and they begin to prophesy and speak in tongues and thousands of people come to know Jesus in that same day and it is a fantastic story and I would encourage you to read it and uh, pay attention to it it is very good but there are many other instances of the Holy Spirit acting in uh, the lives of the church of God's chosen people. And today, in particular, we are going to look at uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And this is the story of the Valley of Dry Bones. And if you remember, Ezekiel is a prophet who is called to serve the people of Judah while they are in exile. He is called to minister to them and to not only show them the depth of their sin and why they are in exile, but also to give them the hope that God has for them. And so Ezekiel chapter 37 is a, a vision that Ezekiel receives uh, in and amongst the many that he gets from God. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I look, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you back to the land of Israel, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle in you in your own land. Then you will know that I am the Lord, that I, the Lord, have spoken, excuse me, and that I have done it, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this is one of those prophecies that has multiple levels to it. It has important 
uh, obviously impact and meaning for the people of Israel, for the people of Judah, as they are living in exile in uh, in Babylon and so on. They they need to hear these words of hope. But they also have significant meaning for us, significant meaning that is relevant to us and to, indeed, all people on this earth. There are a few things that we need to notice about this prophecy. Of course, first and foremost, we need to see that the Valley of Dry Bones is filled with many dry bones, right? Full of bones, says Ezekiel. These dry bones, though, are not just any bones. It's not like a, a graveyard where people came and conscientiously buried their dead uh, with gravestones and all due honor and so on and so forth. It is very clear from the text that this is a battleground. Listen, for example, prophesy, uh, this is what uh, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. This is verse 9. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. They didn't just die. They were killed. And then further on, we see that this vast army came and stood to life, stood up on their feet, a vast army, verse 10, right? This is an army. But then God speaks to Ezekiel and says that this is not just any army, but it is the whole house of Israel, God says in verse 11, the whole house of Israel. And surely not every person within Israel was a soldier, right? There would have been the elderly, there would have been women and children, there would have been lots of people who were not soldiers. But yet here, God is saying this is the whole house of Israel, and they are all an army. And that is important. Because remember, when God brings the people out of out of Egypt way back when, they were, uh, they were his mighty people. And they were to be a sign and a symbol to all the nations. Either they were going to be a sign and symbol of what it looked like to be God's people and obey him, or they were going to be a sign of what it looked like to be God's people and disobey him. Now, by the time we get to Ezekiel, it is pretty clear that, that at least for now, the people of Israel have become a sign to the nations around of what it looks like to be God's people and yet to disobey him. The promise and the hope that they had has been dashed by their own, uh, their own falseness, their own lies, their own faithlessness. They have betrayed God. And so now they are serving as an example to the nations of what happens when you disobey your Lord, your God. But it is important, too, that this applies not just to the people of Israel as God's chosen covenant people. Yes, it does. But it also applies to all of humanity, right? Because all of humanity was originally called to be God's people. Adam and Eve were supposed to be God's people. And all of their children were supposed to be God's people. And through Jesus, we see that all people are called back into God's fold, God's family, God's community. And so this message is for us too. We, just like the people of Israel, regardless of our age, regardless of our gender, regardless of our marital status or anything like that, we are called to be in the vast army of the people of Israel. The book of Hebrews makes it clear that we are Abraham's spiritual descendants. That through Jesus, we have become part of the house of Israel. But of course, here's the problem. The problem is that the whole house of Israel is dead. Is dead. 
Now, obviously, this is not literally too true in the time of Ezekiel any more than it is today, right? It's not that every single Israelite is dead. It wasn't true then either. But God is speaking about how without him, they are spiritually dead. And he is also speaking about the truth that literally they will die, just as Adam and Eve were told that they would die, and they did. So too it is true for us. Without God, apart from God, we are spiritually dead. And we also physically die. We're so dead that there's not even a shred of moisture or, or life left in us. Dry, dry bones. Many bones on the floor of the valley. Verse 2. Bones that were very dry. Brothers and sisters, this was the truth and the reality for the people of Israel. They were dead, 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 dead. But it is also true. It was also true for us. Take a look, brothers and sisters, at the story of the disciples. Even the disciples who walked around with Jesus for, you know, the three-ish years of his ministry, they walked around with him and they didn't get it. They still didn't get it. It wasn't until the day of Pentecost that finally they get it. I mean, they're still not perfect afterwards. We see problems like we talked about during our confession and assurance, and we see problems later on as well, other problems. None of those people become instantaneously perfect. But before Pentecost, there is something about them that is dead, 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 dry, dead bones. They want to live. But the Spirit of God has not yet come into their lives. Oh yes, the healing that Jesus brings has put flesh back on their bones, has bring, brought the tendons together, has brought the skin onto those bones. But without the Spirit, they don't quite get it. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to look at Pentecost at least in part this way. We often, in the CRC, I feel like we're a little bit uncomfortable with the day of Pentecost. It's this day when this weird stuff happens, you know, flames on people's heads and, and speaking in tongues and healing and miraculous thousands of people coming to know the Lord. And, and, and we know we ought to celebrate Pentecost and we know that the Spirit of God lives within us, but we're a little uncomfortable often especially with the things that feel more spectacular to us. But brothers and sisters, fundamentally, what Pentecost is about is about this prophecy. It's about making the dry, dry bones live. That's what God asks Ezekiel right in the beginning. Can these bones live in verse 3? But then he, he, he goes on after these people have, have, have been uh, awoken. He, he says, I will put my spirit in you and you will live in this verse 14. And you will settle in your own land. Then you know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. And of course, part of that is the reality of the people of Israel being restored back to the land of Israel when they come back from exile. But part of that is also about us, about us coming to live in the land that God has prepared for us, the new heaven and the new earth, where God has prepared a place for us, where we will finally be home. 
And in the meantime, where God's Spirit lives within us. And yet, so often, we walk around as if we're normal. We walk around as if we are numb. As if we were almost zombies. Think about the man who is healed. You know the story, uh, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Remember that story, right? He jumped and skipped with joy and danced. How often do you or I Dance for the joy of being alive. How often do we sing for the joy of being alive? How often do we truly live the life that is freely ours through Jesus and by the power of the Spirit living within us? Brothers, this week, Sisters, this week, with this Pentecost, remember that the Holy Spirit did not just come to give spectacular gifts to people. He did do that too. The Spirit did do that too. But also, and even more, the Spirit came so that these dry bones, your dry bones, could live. Let us pray. Father in heaven, on this Pentecost, we pray that you would help us, that you would remind us that we are alive, alive in a way we could never be without your spirit living within us. Help us, O oh God, to dance and sing and skip for joy because of you, O oh God. May we relish the life that we have been given. And may we do so through the power of your Spirit, so that all may see and wonder at our joy, at our life, at our vibrancy, given through your Son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. One more quick little note to add on to this. You remember, if you've seen it, the, one, the story, uh, the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, right? Classic Christmas film. One of my favorites of all time. I love, I love that story. And when the main character, when the main character goes through the story and comes out, and I won't spoil it too much if you haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it, see it if you can. <clears throat> but when the main character finally realizes that he is alive, he goes through his house and his town exuberant and joyful. There's, a, there's an old newel post top in, in the house that constantly comes off and it used to be nothing but annoying and he pulls it off and he, he laughs and he kisses it because he's so filled with joy over the life that he has been given. And he weepingly kisses his family, his wife and his children. And he repents of the wicked things he had done and takes joy in family and friends. He rejoices, truly rejoices. Brothers and sisters, we were dead. We were dead. And now we are alive. Let us live with joy. Amen.